Welcome back to my gathering basket. My name is Danelle. Thank you so much for all of you that joined me in my last episode. Your comments and actually getting more than the two people that promised they would watch if I did this was so much fun. And for those of you that are just discovering me this week, thank you so much for coming in and joining me. So I wasn't sure that in two weeks time I would have enough to show you. And then the other day I started putting stuff together into my basket, my gathering basket, and I realized that my goodness, it's been a busy two weeks. So I actually do have quite a bit to show you. Let's get started. Last time I started off with spinning. It was Tour de Fleece, and I had kind of hinted that I probably wouldn't get everything done. And sure enough, I didn't. But I did get a couple projects done, including those that I was hoping to send off to the State Fair. State Fair um, is this week in Missouri, the next two weeks actually, and all the entries had to be in the week before, and one of the ladies in our guild was going to be going up to enter some things and talk to some of the organizers. So she offered to take, in fact she kind of twisted the arms of several of us to make some things to enter. And I'm, I was not really excited about sending things, not because it, I just didn't want the pressure of having to get them finished. But it turned out it was a lot of fun and I'm glad she kind of twisted my arm. And if things go as planned, later um, this coming week in a couple days, I'm actually going to go up with her. A um, couple of them in the guild that in the past have always shown sheep are going up for the sheep show just for the day. So it's a long ride up there. I think it's about three and a half hours or so. Um, we're just gonna go up, make a quick trip for the day. But that'll give me a chance to walk around the Home Arts uh, building and get a chance to see what I entered and also, um, what other people have put in and what kind of entries are there, what, what the competition is like, and maybe set some goals for next year. But what I did get done, uh, the one I'm gonna show you anyway, is this one. I got it all two, it's two ply. So I got it all plied up. I haven't done a final count after washing it, but I believe it's somewhere around the neighborhood of about 580 yards. Um, and I'm very pleased with how it turned out. I cannot wait. I'm hoping to make a lace shawl with this. I just, I've got so many pattern ideas that I think would work and I haven't narrowed it down yet. This is um, a BFL silk blend from my friend Peggy at the 100th Sheep. And this is her opulence colorway, which is so well named. I said last time there was just no way to really show the depth of color and the shine that's on this yarn. I just, oh, I cannot wait to get this. I think it's gonna be such pretty lace. So I got that done. I also um, had my cotton finished and I was able to get that put together for competition. <sighs> Goodness, guys, putting something together for competition is tough. I told myself that I was just going to do what I would normally do. I wasn't gonna do anything special looked at the guidelines for state fair and they're very specific and kind of like a grade school test. If you don't do everything just right, you can get thrown out. And um, I wasn't, yeah, it just all depends on the judges, but I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna at least do follow the guidelines. So this contest actually specifies 40 yards of your hand spun yarn. So I set my warping board to a two yard, um, which was also the requirement, it had to be a two yard skein. Um, put my yarn on the swift and I started winding off and counting the yards and you'd get to about 36 yards and all of a sudden there'd be a slub in the yarn. Oh, I can't send that, I gotta, so clip it off and then start over and you get to about 26 yards and there was a little pigtail in the plying and it just, oh, I can't send that. It, it, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. So finally, I just, I had to kind of bite the bullet. It's not perfect, but this is what I do. And this represents the work that I've done. So close your eyes, count to 40, <laughs> put it together, um, skein it up. And I'm, I'm really happy I got that sent in. I also sent in a pair of colorwork mittens and a sweater. So I think I had 
five entries all together. So I'm really, I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm hoping it works out. Nothing happens this week that I'll be able to um, take the ride up to Sedalia, Missouri for the Missouri State Fair. Really looking forward to that. Also, the poultry show is going on at the same time. So for someone who has chickens, I the one time I went up um, and was able to see the poultry show, it was a lot of fun. So really looking forward to that as well. So as I said last time, now that I have these two, I had three projects that were on my wheels last time. And that had been my goal for Tour de Fleece was to finish all those up. So I got two completely finished. And the third one is also gonna be a rather long-term project. This is probably the softest yarn I have ever in my life touched. It is crazy, crazy soft. This is a alpaca angora rabbit and silk blend. And it is just down soft. It, it literally sticks to everything. It is so light. And when I got this a couple years ago, um, my goal had been to try support spindling. And I got that much done. I actually bought four ounces, which now I'm kind of thinking I was insane to do. Um, but I got that much put together. And then I had a sh weird shoulder injury. I actually <laughs> was closing my barn door and jerked my shoulder a little weird. And after that, it just, that drafting motion, I, I just, I couldn't do it um, for very long at a time. And it just, it just didn't make it fun. So I kind of abandoned my um, support spindle project, although I, I did really enjoy it. I'm not much of a spindle spinner, but I did really kind of, of the spindles, I think the support spindle would be the one that I would gravitate to. So maybe one of these days I'll take it back. Definitely not getting rid of the spindle, but I really wanted to get that fiber done. And just to give you an idea of how puffy this fiber is, here's two ounces huge bag. I have two of these bags. And I, again, I think this would make a gorgeous lace shawl because it's just spinning up so, so, so super fine. You can just draft this down to two or three fibers at a time and make it, I'm not quite going that crazy intensely small, um, but it, it is spinning up really nice and fine. This was some that I bought at our local fiber festival a couple years ago. Uh, fiber Days is the name of it and that's held in September and in Mount Vernon, Missouri. It's coming up just in a few weeks and my friend Kathleen always has a booth there. She has alpaca. I want to say she may have some sheep. I can't remember for sure, but she usually uses her alpaca and then all sorts of other things. She'll have banana. She'll have pineapple. She'll have all sorts of different kinds of silks. Um, I've got quite a bit of her fiber and yarns. I did a sweater out of some of her yarn that was a silk alpaca blend i believe um, it's actually the one that is at state fair right now so i'm i'm anxious to see how that does but i really like her her blends and and her fiber is just i've spun some cormo from her um her, her stuff is always very very nice to spin and a little unusual so i'm i'm really enjoying this I know that the way it's spinning up so fine, I've got it on my Ashford Joy right now, and I'm just spinning a little bit at a time. So I know it's gonna be a long-term project. My goal had been to not start anything new until I had that complete. However, <laughs> that's a lot of light brown yarn, and I may just have to pop some color onto another wheel and again, go back and forth. I haven't made up my mind. For right now, I'm enjoying um, that fiber actually had kind of taken probably a year hiatus and I am I just, I wanna knit with it. So I, I, need to, I need to apply myself to that project and finish it. But it is nice to have my other two wheels freed up and I can put something else on there. I probably will <laughs> fairly soon. So that's what I'm doing spinning wise. And then in knitting, okay, so my success in spinning has been offset by my lack of success in knitting right now. I'm not sure why I have just been in this summer slump in my knitting. I told you last time I was working on 
sugar maple and I got about seven inches. I was on my third color of the gradient and almost, let's see, it's right here. Wait, that's the front. So I had, and I think I had told you I was having some gauge. I had to do some sweater math. And here's a, a lesson that I knew, but apparently needed a reminder of. So I got seven inches done just to the point where I could, um, it's just little cap sleeves, with raglan shaping. So I got just to the point where I had divided for the sleeves and joined there so that I could put it on a, I, I just, I kind of cheated. I didn't put it on waist yarn. I just used a couple different needles and cause really all I was worried about was it going over my head and the sleeve. So, and I, I just kind of, as I looked at it, I wasn't sure that it was gonna quite fit. And unfortunately this time I was right. So it went on just fine, but I thought I was gonna have to call for help to get the thing off. And it turned out I had to pop the, the stitches off and stretch it right off the needles in order to get the thing off. Well, that's not gonna work on a regular basis. So I kind of sulked for about two days I actually tried to record this podcast yesterday, and I believe this was the night before that I had had this realization <clears throat> that my sweater math was not correct. Um, so when I recorded the first time, it was sitting in my basket in timeout, and I just, I really wasn't sure if I was going to continue with it pick a new pattern. The pattern is neat. I've always wanted to knit it. The yarn is amazing. So again, from my friend Peggy at the 100th Sheep, and I really, really wanted to use that to its best advantage because it's such a pretty gradient. And I just wasn't sure, did I pick the wrong marriage of pattern and yarn or throw in my lack of skill? Um, and then today I, I thought, okay, it's been, two days, <laughs> I just need to, I, I need to decide. And a little bit more on, on um, ripping out coming later in this episode as well. So I bit the bullet and grabbed one of the other colors in the gradient and I am a serious swatcher. <laughs> but it was enough to tell me I was way closer in gauge this using a size four than I had been with this in a size two. Now, lesson learned that I already knew but apparently needed a refresher on, I swatched for this about 18 months ago. And at the time I had made a counting error and I had another project that kind of had a self-imposed deadline. So I just kind of rolled this all up with the needles and the swatch, put it in a bag, kind of made a kit out of it. I had the pattern all of that together and set it aside. So this time I picked it up 18 months later and picked up the needles, put them back on a cable and started off knitting. Gauge changes. So I should have, because when I got started with this, it doesn't really match my gauge swatch that I had. It's, it is slightly tighter. So what I had made in my swatch that just, um, when I had used the size four before and swatched, it just looked like mesh. It was way too loose. I don't know what I was, I don't know what made the difference. It may just be time. May have been stress level when I started this. I'm not sure. But when I used the size four, I was able to get within a half a stitch of perfect gauge. So decision made after this is done, I may reward myself for editing by ripping out seven inches of a sweater. <laughs> anyway, I'm not quite as upset about it as I was when I recorded yesterday. In fact, my ramblings about being so upset are probably part of the reason why I didn't go ahead and record yesterday. Decision made, we're gonna redo. So that was one. And then I had shown you my latest Croy socks that were kind of my purse knitting. And we have two. Now I am normally a stripe matcher. 
that's my preference. Um, these matched really well on the top. Not so much on the bottom. And I'm okay with that. It's all right. These guys were on sale for $3.50 a ball. And I'm for $3.50 a ball not going to gripe about the fact that there was one knot in this skein that required me to join and um, be a little out of sequence. I could have rewound things and worked it around to wear it, but these are gonna be work socks. That's what I like with the Peyton's Croy socks. They are iron to wear. They're a little bit bigger yarn than um, uh, most of the fingering weights that I'm used to, like from the Indie Dyers. So they work great for winter boot socks. Um, I am one of those that is cold natured, um, or as my niece said <laughs> to me, I am normally quite a cold human. <laughs> so I wear wool socks pretty much year round, but in the winter, these are really nice. So I'm working on my stash of those, building up my supply, and um, I will be casting on another colorway. But I was really glad, again, yesterday when I tried to record, I was about it here and um, I had made a mistake on the heel. So had you heard my podcast yesterday as I recorded it, I was really in a knitting slump. But I decided that after comparing the heels, um, and this is the vanilla is the new black pattern that I talked about last time. You can see that ribbed heel. I really like the way that fits my foot. Um, it, it looks neat and I've never had it slide. It grips. Um, I haven't had any of those long enough to know the wearability of it, how long it's going to last, but um, they say that it's, it's a very durable heel. Um, so I put the two together and decided, even with my little mistake that was like a two row difference, it wasn't going to affect the fit of the sock anyway. So um, not perfect, but done. <laughs> so I have that done and I'm kind of ready for, um, I, I needed kind of some in-between. I had a, we, we were at farmer's market yesterday, my mom and I selling vegetables. So I needed a farmer's market project. When we go to farmer's market, and sometimes my mom goes, sometimes I go, sometimes we both get to go. Yesterday was a day that we both were able to be there, which was a lot of fun. Our regular customers know that I always have some sort of project going. Sometimes it's crochet, sometimes it's knitting, sometimes I actually bring one of my travel spinning wheels with me. Um, that's a blast. The kids always want to crawl up on my lap and, and try to spin, and, and um, yeah, I've entertained a lot of kids that way. Um, the other thing we do is I do rug weaving and we will take uh, sheets and strips of fabric along and mom and I will tear those sheets because that can be a very dusty, dirty job to do inside. So when you're out in the open and I have somebody that can help me, it just goes so much faster and I don't have as much cleanup in the house. Um, and that's really entertaining because it's loud, tear that that sheet um, and we usually do like a foot of it at a time in little strips so we're pulling like five or six different strips a piece and it makes this really loud noise and boy it draws attention to our booth <laughs> but it also gets a lot of a lot of my fiber work done for my weaving but this time um, I had the socks and they were pretty well done um, so I needed kind of an, a, an in-between project which sometimes are things like the dishcloths and other times, and this project just amuses me. It's a sock cuff that I use on my mugs, on travel, travel mugs like this. These are just the cheap plastic, um, use until they die and then recycle them kind of things that you can buy it at the dollar store. Um, they're really thin, so if you like your, your tea or coffee, I'm a tea drinker, if you like it really hot, it can really burn. And um, so one day I, I had been like wrapping it in, in um, washcloths or dishcloths or something like that to take to work if it was still hot. Um, and one day I thought, this is really kind of dumb. Danelle, you're a knitter. You can, you can make a mug cozy. 
So I grabbed some of my, again, my Peyton's Croy. I just happened to be working with that yarn at that time. And I made a sock cuff. <laughs> and the part that makes this so amusing to me is anywhere I go, I can be wearing a hand knit sweater, hand knit socks, Work. In fact, one time I did at a conference, I had on one of my prettiest hand knit sweaters. Um, I was knitting on a pair of socks. I had on socks and I was drinking tea out of my mug with one of these on it. The thing that got the most attention of all of that was this thing. And I think it's so funny how people who aren't necessarily knitters or crafters as a knitter, I'm drawn to the really complex show off pieces, so to speak, something that's going to push my skills. Um, and the people that aren't the knitters, they're drawn to the really simple things. So this is a really practical, it doesn't take any time at all. I usually work them on DPNs. It's another fantastic purse project. And I'm trying to build up my supply of these because winter is coming and I will be carrying more hot mugs. So again, this is just Peyton's Croy. I'm gonna be making a pair of socks. This was actually a scrap ball that somebody had given me. Um, and then I found that this is the blue striped rag colorway from Peyton's Croy. So I'm not sure if that'll be the next of my socks, but it's kind of just a fun, um, fun colorway. So took me farmer's market morning to get all knit up. And again, I had I don't know how many people stop me um, and ask what I was doing. Being on the DPNs always enthralls people, even knitters. I had several people yesterday that are knitters. And they said, how can you do that with all those needles? And it was kind of fun to be a knitting ambassador and show them how it works. And hey, this really isn't as big a mystery as you want. But if you want to be impressed by me, it's okay. Um, and it made them laugh. So that was kind of, that's been my knitting. Um, sock knitting wise right now I am um, going back to I had started this a while back and I don't know something interfered some sort of timeline um, this is a Gales art sock blank I've only knit from a couple sock blanks and I really kind of enjoy it so this one I am knitting up into See if you can see that pattern. I'm not sure that I did the best job of combining uh, yarn and pattern on this because it's a little hard to see the pattern. It's just like a little, there you can see the texture. A little bit of a cable. This is the Hither and Thither Socks pattern by Zoe Carter of the Pins and Needles podcast. Um, new pattern by her that she put out this spring, I believe it was, and I got started on it. It's a really fun, very easy kind of potato chip um, do I believe it's four rows one direction and then four rows the other direction so it's you know I'll, I'll do these four it's almost like striping the the pattern really makes makes a nice little stripe so it's kind of like working with a self striping yarn in that I'll just do one more I'll do one more um, but for some reason it just got put away and I need to I need I'm, I'm at the point you can just barely see I just started the increases for the vanilla is the new black the ribbed heel um, I'm substituting her heel pattern um, for that ribbed heel so I need to I mean this is this one's halfway done essentially and I need to just apply myself and and whiz through the rest of this and get the next one started so I think that's all of my knitting right now and like I said, I'm, I'm actually in a much better place knitting wise today than I was yesterday. Hopefully that will continue and I'll have some more forward progress to show next time we talk. So from knitting, we're gonna hop over to sewing. And I said that I had some more ripping out experiences that works with sewing as well as knitting. And I'm not sure which is I guess it depends on which one I'm doing currently, which one I like the least. I had another project. It's hanging right here. A quilt that I made probably 12 years ago, maybe? Something like that. Um, I went to spend a weekend with a friend of mine in Virginia. And it was kind of just one of those, hey, I need a quick 
get away before the next school year starts. And um, I just kind of randomly called her up and said, hey, if I can come out, can I crash at your place for the weekend just as a getaway? Um, don't need to entertain me, don't need to feed me. I just kind of wanted to get away. Well, she is an amazing master quilter and she had um, to work that weekend, but she said, hey, my quilt studio is your quilt studio for the weekend. Help yourself to what other fabric, you know how to run the machines, have fun. I'll see you in the evening if you have any questions, here's my phone number, you have work. So I spent two and a half days binding some of her quilts by hand um, in exchange for getting to use the most amazing quilting stash I've ever seen. And I work at a quilt shop and this, her, her studio, she had a three car garage um, that had been converted into this whole studio and floor to ceiling, shelves of fabric, three sewing machines, a long arm machine, which I didn't know at the time how to use, but um, so I just had time to play and grabbed a pattern that you know looked through her two bookshelves of pattern books, magazines, found a pattern that was nothing I would ever pick out normally. This is not necessarily my color or style, but it just looked fun. And at that point, that's what I needed, the bright colors and uh, just something new to try. So this was actually my first time doing piecing on the machine. I typically really enjoy hand piecing and hand quilting. But again, I was needing a quick project that I could do while I was there for the weekend. So I thought, ah, we'll give it a try. So it's just a uh, basically one inch strip squares that's strip pieced in the background. And then these flowers applique over. And I really, I don't know if you can see, here's one. Some of these flowers where you use the cutout of the the piece strip piecing to make part of the flower so you have kind of that reverse and it was just it was really fun um and then i got home after that weekend and my intention had been just to outline quilt around the flowers real easy hang it on the wall wasn't really sure what i was going to do with it um so i tried and at the time the machine that i had still have wasn't the best option for free motion quilting like that especially um with with the yeah to get the the batting and all of that I didn't have for those of you that sew I didn't have the ability on that machine to drop the feed dogs so it kind of pulled and twisted my fabric sandwich a little bit and I, I did it and it was okay but it just wasn't something I was terribly proud to hang on my wall it just wasn't I kept pulling it out every couple years and saying, I'm going to finish it. I just need to finish it. And it just never was, it just wasn't right. It's kind of like that sweater. I could have just monkeyed around and um, added a few rows and ripped it back a little bit, but it just, just wasn't right. <laughs> and I'm not a terrible perfectionist for the most part, but I just, I don't know. There was something nagging. So after much thought and talking to some other quilting friends, I sat down uh, the beginning of this week and took my seam ripper and started in and pulled out all of the seams that I had made all around each of these little points and all of that. And you know, it was one of those things, and fingers crossed it's what happens with this sweater, but it was kind of one of those things that after I ripped about the first 10 stitches, it was just like, weight off my shoulders. Okay, I made the right decision and we're gonna do this correctly in, in a way that that I am gonna be happy to hang this on my wall. And I guess I finally have a place in this house where I can, several places that I could put it and I kinda like the pop of color now where I didn't necessarily before. So I'm really anxious to get it hung up and that's helping. It took me probably four nights of ripping little tiny seams because that was part of my problem because I didn't have the right um, type of settings on my machine. It made itty bitty itty bitty, itty bitty, itty bitty, itty bitty, almost tore the fabric kind of stitches. So I had a lot of picking to do. But the more I picked, the more I, th I really half expected I would get halfway done and just go scrap it. 
But the more I did, the happier I was with the quilt. And I really like the way the top looks now. And I'll probably just put it together, two options. I'll either wash it, block it, get it all ironed, um, because it has set in storage for a number of years. So get it all freshened up. That gives a chance for the needle holes that are that I can see, you probably can't, where I ripped out the fabric. Uh, you can still see the needle marks. So that hopefully will let that fabric relax and kind of fill those back in. And I could actually kind of just mount it onto board and hang it that way as a piece of fabric art rather than a quilt. Um, or option B, which I'm kind of leaning towards, I know uh, at the shop on our long arm, I've, there's a quilting pattern that I really like that has butterflies and dragonflies and uh, little daisies. And I think it would actually do a good job of filling in and adding some extra character to the quilt top. So that's depending on what our schedule is for the machine, whether or not I have some time to sneak in and, and do a project of my own. Um, that's probably where I'm leaning to. But again, a lesson that I knew but needed a refresher of, sometimes it's just worth it to rip it out and start over and make what you really wanted to make in the beginning. Update on the butterflies. I have let five monarch butterflies go. All of them have hatched. I have five more chrysalises hanging in the cage. I was gonna bring one over to show you, but they're getting so close to hatching that I really kind of hate to move them. But I'm probably at the end of my butterfly raising for this season, simply because we are so dry. Um, grass is turning brown. Um, we're, we're really praying because it, there's a storm kind of circling the area and like I had one clap of thunder earlier this afternoon and we're just really hoping that that little tiny red dot on the radar might actually give us a little bit of rain. But the milkweed is just dying out um, and even watering it occasionally just isn't, isn't reviving it enough to be a host plant for um, very voracious eating caterpillars. But the way that I am going to blend in my butterfly raising and my fiber obsession. Um, if you've ever seen milkweed, these are the pods, the seed pods. And inside, do this very carefully, you have this almost pine cone. Let's see if you can, these little scaly seeds. And attached to every one of those brown seeds is a little fiber. And when you pop that open and let the fiber dry, I don't know if you can see this at all. See those little tiny whiffs of, if you've ever, the more common one, if you've ever seen a dandelion head and blown it and seen all the seeds go, well, this is dandelion fuzz on steroids. So last year, I was at the Play Away Festival in Kansas City and I was looking at a couple of the booths, had these really odd mixtures, just different, not odd, I guess, of spinning fiber. And two of them, two different booths, had fiber that said milkweed. And I thought, oh, they're probably using milk protein and this is just what it's called or something. And then I read a little bit more on one of the packages and it was saying, from milkweed harvested in Wisconsin. So I went up and asked the, the vendor, um, is this really what I think it is? And he said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're experimenting, I guess, with milkweed fiber. So I started looking and sure enough, there's several places, University of Kansas, um, that hosts the Monarch Watch, which is what I have been working with my, mo my Monarch raising through. Um, they had a whole article that, written by a, um, I think it was a master's student had done some research and uh, she had all different information. I just barely read it. Um, I need to go back to it. <laughs> and she had all different information on different blends, uh, the amount of, I haven't seen anybody spinning it by itself, but milkweed and cotton and milkweed and wool and different percentages of what spun the best. And so I have been, for one thing, I've been saving the seeds, um, harvesting these and giving those to several friends that want to start butterfly gardens this next year. 
And then I've been using, when I pull off the seeds, I'm left with all of the milkweed fuzz. And I've been saving that to um, play this winter with some spinning. So again, when it finally hit me, it was like, I have my own milkweed fiber. <laughs> again, I'm growing cotton and I'm growing milkweed. <laughs> So my, my own little brand of, of fiber farming, I guess. Um, but anyway, you know, one of, the, one of the principles, I guess, maybe that's a little overstated, of being a homesteader is trying to find multiple purposes to the same thing. How many different uses can I get out of my hard work in this area? So these are fantastic for the pollinators. They're just plain pretty. And it's given me a chance, again, to do a lot of education with people about butterflies, about pollinator gardening, um, all of that. And then bonus points, I have some fiber to play with as well. So I'm, I'm curious, you probably will hear more about this. Win or lose, I don't know how it's going to work. Um, I, I need to pull out my carters and, uh, and start playing a little bit with that. So that's the butterfly update. Oh, and I did have a question about, um, I mentioned that I was spending a lot of time in field guides and somebody reminded me, hey, you didn't tell us what field guide you used. Um, I used the one that was the most cost effective with the highest rating on Amazon. That's about what I can recommend, but it has been a very good one. This is the Kaufman Field Guide to Butterflies of North America. Um, and it does a very good job of giving you, there's been several things, um, it, it just has, it, it's very um, succinct information, but it does a good job of giving the um, distinctives, you know, this is how you tell the difference between this and this. And um, so it's, it's been a very good, I, so far I've been able to identify everything that I've looked up um, from that book. So I have one of those for butterflies. I have the companion book also for moths of North America. Um, maybe next year I'll get into the moths. This year I'm learning butterflies. <laughs> lot to learn, lot to learn. Um, so let's see. And then um, another fibery thing. It is getting time. I'm actually kind of behind right now, but I'm trying to get my natural dyes things harvested. And I've missed a few, I've missed the cosmos, um, but my marigolds are doing great right now. I love those bright oranges and yellows and it makes a wonderful dye. Uh, it's blowing out here. Um, it's a rich, deep golden yellow. Um, I used these in Colorwork Mittens earlier this, this winter. So, um, and, and it's been color fast, it hasn't faded, it just, it, it makes a really, really nice dye. So I've been harvesting my marigolds, um, kind of clipping off heads a little bit at a time so I don't totally devastate my flower bed, but um, I've got drying racks full of marigolds and then I have several fleeces that are at the mill for processing and they told me it would probably be beginning of next year before I get those back. So I'm kind of saving things and uh, goldenrod will be blooming here in our region before long and I've got a couple friends that are um, that have pasture land out outside of town um, and so I've got them on the hunt for good goldenrod patches that I can go and um, snitch from and I haven't haven't tried goldenrod so I'm looking forward to that. So there's my my dyeing for today and then I told you that garden wise we are if we don't get this rain our garden is probably pretty done for the season. We did go ahead and get um, fall crops in, um, beans, some zucchini, um, basil, dill, lettuce, spinach, beets, um, a lot of, oh, milkweed fuzz, still blowing around. Um, so a lot of things like that that we can actually get a second crop that do well in the cooler temperatures. But everything else is just looking out this window <laughs> at our garden and it's, it's just really looking sad. So. On one hand, I'm, I'm okay with that. We've gotten a lot of our, um, our freezer is pretty well full of beans. We've gotten plenty of corn. Um, we're not getting as much popcorn as we wanted, but um, we still have a little bit of that to harvest. I told you last time that I was getting ready to can tomato sauce and we did get about half of this year's supply done. Um, we've got another big batch that we're gonna probably be canning up in the next day or two. And um, yeah. 
So we've got this going. This is just plain old tomato sauce. It's nothing but tomato, salt, and citric acid. And normally I would go ahead and make like spaghetti sauce, pizza sauce, that kind of thing. But this year, just to save time and because I wanted to do my own vegetables in it, um, to do like the peppers and garlic and onion and all that. And they weren't quite setting on as much. Um, and I really didn't want to have to go buy those just to make our sauce. So um, I'm, I'm pretty um, adamant about using correct canning techniques. So my go-to is the Ball Blue Book. I think this is last year's or the years before. I can't remember, I just pulled one of them. I usually update it about every two years. They put out a new one every year. Um, recommendations don't usually change on a yearly basis. So I do update every couple years and usually check out their website for updates in between. Um, most of the recipes that they have are for very small batches. So I wasn't going to go through all the trouble to do four pints of pizza sauce or four pints of spaghetti sauce when I can fit seven in my canner. And I just didn't have enough vegetables to do a big batch to bring out the pressure canner. Um, so we decided, mom and I talked back and forth and we decided that this year we're gonna try something a little different. We just did the regular tomato sauce, just plain tomato sauce, and then Usually when the temperatures cool off, we get, um, of course we get our onions, they're curing right now, and they'll be ready to um, start chopping up to freeze or dehydrate. And then our peppers are just, if we get rain, they are loaded and we'll get a good pepper crop this, um, this fall. So the plan is to get all of that together, get it frozen and or dehydrated, put all of those together, so I'll make this is sounding really complex, but I can freeze the, the onions, freeze the peppers all chopped up. Um, I usually just put those in the food processor, whiz them up real quick and put them in bags. And then I will take um, the peppers, the onion, the garlic, um, all of that together and kind of make spice packets, uh, vegetable packets that I can freeze in the right amounts. So I can take a pint or a quart of tomato sauce, stick it in the pot and put all of my ingredients together. I don't have to measure things out and get out multiple bags. Um, I'll just have all of that ready to go. But because I can freeze it and the same works with dehydrating, I've done both and I'll probably do both again this year. Um, I can preserve those at different times and then put them together when I have everything. Um, and as I get to, as I get that, maybe I'll, I'll show you what I'm doing. Just, I don't know if that makes any sense what I said. So that's the canning. Um, I'm also working on a garlic order for this year because it's going to be just about a month or so before it's time to be planting the garlic again. Um, it's crazy when you get into gardening how seasonal things are and you're always looking ahead and we're planning the garden for next year as we're tearing things out, um, finishing rows of, of beans and different kinds of squash. We're talking, you know, which varieties did well, which didn't do well, did we have too much, too little, and planning ahead towards next year already. So um, that is, I think, my notes fell away. I'm, I'm long off my notes. Um, but I think that's everything that I have, or at least a pretty good representation of what the last couple weeks have been for me in the garden, in the craft room. I hope that there was something there that interests you this time. Please join me again next time. My plan, my hope is to be able to do this about every two weeks. That seems like enough time to give me something to talk about. Um, I'm not, I, my hope is to do this on Mondays, but right now I do have to go to the county library to be able to upload this. So that kind of restricts my ability to get this uploaded to YouTube. I will put all of my contact information at the end. Feel free to leave comments. I will do my best to put some show notes and links um, in the description box of this video. But if there's any questions, just pop them in the comments or I'll have my email, my Ravelry, my Instagram. Um, please join me on any of those places. Thank you so much for spending an afternoon, just a little bit of time with me. See you next time.